Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to George Galloway, a member of parliament here in the UK. George Galloway, welcome to the Kaiser Thank Report. You. All right, George Galloway, got to get to this right away. You're against Scottish independence. Tell us the economic and monetary reasons for your position. Well, first of all, it wouldn't really be independence. Uh, we'd still be in the European Union, and we'd still have an unelected monarch as our head of state. And, of course, the question of which currency we would use is a moot one. Uh, the Bank of England, the Treasury, would surely not allow an independent country to operate the pound because that would be giving the Scottish government power without responsibility. And the Westminster authorities in the city uh, would have no authority over what the uh, Scottish government, the newly independent Scottish state, was doing with the currency, doing with rates of tax, doing with uh, interest rates, and so on. So that's an impossibility. So the possibility emerges of joining the euro. Well, how's that going? Who in Scotland would be persuaded to go quietly into that good night? There have been occasions when the Scottish independence movement has floated the idea of Scotland as Iceland, mm. Scotland as, uh, I don't know, the Republic of Ireland before it sank. Uh, and, of course, the Republic of Ireland is in the euro, but the Icelanders are not. And we know the ash that uh, enveloped the currency and indeed the economy and the whole society there. So the question of which money the independent Scottish state would use is a moot one. Uh, but of course the more serious problems are that an independent Scotland would trigger a race to the bottom for working people. Why? Because without 71 anti-conservative MPs coming from Scotland, which is precisely the number now, 71 anti-conservatives, one conservative, there would be perpetually right-wing conservative government in England. And in England, the government would ensure, surely, that rates of corporate taxation, personal taxation, public expenditure levels, etc., were so low that the Scottish government would have no alternative, even if they weren't enthusiastic about doing so, which they are, of following them to the bottom. At which point, what price the so-called progressive, even socialist, independent Scotland that's projected by supporters of the SNP, what price that? Uh, you would have two uh, free market, freedmanite, monetarist governments uh, chasing each other to the bottom. And I think the time would come quite soon that the Scottish people would rue the day that they had broken up uh, this country. And my last point is less powerful now than it once was, but it remains, I think, a fact that in these storm-tossed times, to get out of an ocean liner and get into a rowing boat, which is what a country of five million, with the only population in Western Europe that's actually falling, which is 4,000 miles of coastline, oil and gas fast running out, and huge tracts of the country empty, uh, that would be a very perilous choice for the Scottish people to make. I mean, I understand the pragmatic approach, but how does, you, does your heart kind of match what your head is saying, or is there any kind of... Uh... No, my heart really does. I'm against breaking up uh, countries. I've been against the breakup of virtually every country. I think the partition of India and then its repartition uh, was a mistake. I think the breakup of the former USSR, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, uh, have all been, or Czechoslovakia, now into two states, has all been a, a big mistake that in this world that we have where huge powerful economic forces are at work that democratic states have to come together not splinter asunder and of course if it all goes wrong what happens is a rise in ethnic sectarian tensions national tensions uh, because if it didn't work out the way the Scots hoped that it would, who would be to blame? Who would be blamed for the fact that uh, the Elysian fields promised by the uh, independence movement have not been I delivered? understand that um, to breaking up countries, you're against this kind of idea of breaking up countries, but without this kind of recourse for countries to, to revolt, as it were, uh, there is a consolidation of power always in, at the top of a hierarchy. And we espouse democratic principles, but they're few and far between. The power tends to corrupt. But I wanted to ask you about a comment you make uh, regarding independence, that socialism 
won't work. You're, positioning Scotland is, would be socialist, mm. and that socialism doesn't work. Well, How uh, socialism in one country didn't work, even when the country concerned stretched from the Euros to Vladivostok. The uh, USSR failed as a socialist country with all those uh, people, all that land, all those resources. Scotland has a uh, few resources, hardly any people, and would be uh, attached forever organically to a permanently Tory England. So the idea that an independent Scotland could emerge as a kind of cold water Cuba, which is how it's sold by some on the left uh, in Scotland, is frankly absurd. And when it became clear that it was absurd, as I say, the search would be on for the scapegoats. But let me address, if I may, the point you just made, because you're right. Uh, I'm not suggesting that instead of breaking up countries, we have a kind of super EU run on the current lines. There are many, many serious problems, fundamental problems about that model. But the answer to that is to democratize that model, not to atomize us all into independent states. Every state will have an army, a navy, an air force, a chain of embassies around the world, will have uh, bureaucracies, will have a flag and a border. And the temptations with borders is that you stand at them shouting boo at Johnny Foreigner. That's what's wrong with the Farage uh, UKIP uh, perspective for the UK, and it's what's wrong with the Alex Hammond SNP perspective for well, Scotland. Let's talk about this idea of socialism for a second, because mm. um, if again, if I'm understanding correctly, you're, you're saying, you're suggesting, or if what I'm hearing is that in Scotland's case, it wouldn't necessarily work, but you're not saying, you're not saying, it's not a blanket condemnation of socialism as such, because of course, there's the way that people view the world typically is they, they, they break it into two opposing ideologies, socialism and capitalism. And I, I don't think you could, I would safely put you in the camp of a capitalist. No. So on, under the very crude definitions that we are forced to live with, unfortunately, in this mm. uh, day mm. and age, mm. there's usually that split, socialism, capitalism. If you're not capitalism, you're kind of socialism. But you're saying that it wouldn't necessarily work for Scotland. But you're just saying, just in Scotland's case, because you're not saying socialism as such isn't work, because obviously no. under Venezuela, under Hugo Chavez, a big mm. supporter there, that's a socialist model. So you've got some, uh, how, how do you fine tune it? Yeah. I I, I mean, socialism as a concept is not a busted flush, but it can only work where you have a critical mass of population, resources, and the ability to actually act independently. Scotland has none of these three things. We would not be acting independently because we'd still be tied to the English currency if the English agreed, and they would only agree if we signed over any independent tools of uh, changing the okay. economy. Let me jump in, because yeah. what I'm hearing is, uh, as a tactician, mm. you're saying this is not necessarily mm. a great idea. Mm. And let's r roll this into uh, your, your MP for the Respect Party in the House of Commons. And uh, obviously, the Respect Party wants to increase its influence, and you want to bring in other MPs under the Respect uh, Party. Uh, when you look, you mentioned Nigel Farage for a second. Here's mm. a guy who was really on the outlying force. UKIP started on the fringe. Indeed. And they've really made their way in to mainstream. As a party leader for respect, mm. are there any lessons learned from that, number one, just as a, from a tactical point of view, putting aside the politics for a second? As, as a mere tactician, yeah. Nigel Farage seems like he's done a good job. He has, and uh, <laughs> I try to do the same kind of thing. Be honest, be straight, be real, be a human being, not a speak your weight machine. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Farage is perceived in the country to be all of these things, and I try to do the same. Of course, selling right-wing nationalist ideas to the simple-minded is uh, an easier task than selling left-wing progressive socialist ideas, especially in the uh, sea of uh, media power all around us, uh, which is deeply hostile to the kind of things we talk about. Let me ask you a question. It seems that Nigel Farage's popularity is not really homegrown. It came from foreign media. Nigel Farage is a star on RT because he's been on RT shows. Mm. And this raises global awareness to the point where the UK media couldn't ignore him anymore. This speaks to the fact that a huge institution like the BBC, very centralized autocratic institution here in the UK, is losing its grip. Yep. Murdoch's out of the picture, mm. certainly in his. Is global media now, alternative media, I know you're big on Facebook and Twitter. How's that playing into your 
political uh, ambitions, I uh, guess you could call well, it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you're right that uh, there comes a point at which the mainstream, so-called lamestream British media cannot ignore the phenomena that are phenomenon that are rising in, uh, in the country. One of them is a detestation of the British state in Scotland, of the European Union in England. Uh, others are of what I call the three cheeks of the same backside, the three rulers of the mainstream parties who have an ironclad consensus behind war, privatization, austerity. Uh, the media, the prevailing orthodoxy, Dr. Johnson said, the, the grimmest dictatorship of them all is the dictatorship of the prevailing orthodoxy. And the prevailing orthodoxy would have prevailed were it not for, as you say, foreign media, the uh, existence of Twitter, Facebook, the internet, the ether, the cyber wars, ideological wars that are going on. They have climbed over the walls of that prevailing orthodoxy. Yeah, of course, on the foreign media side, uh, your appearance before Congress in America just mm. a few short years ago uh, testifying, where you slammed uh, the, the gentleman you were, who, was, uh, who was asking you the questions. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you something. I was watching that event, and um, it seems to me that it was a great example of how education in the two countries are vastly different. Because in this country, of course, people grow up debating. And uh, in the House of Parliament, debates are key. Mm. And you see question time every mm. Wednesday. Mm. In the US, there's no such tradition at all. It was watching Muhammad Ali go after a net. Uh, I don't even remember the guy's name. You were debating. Ex-Senator Norman Coleman. Right. Ex-Senator <laughs> Norman Coleman. But it was so one-sided. Mm. And it's not, I mean, you're a brilliant orator mm. on, in your own right. But this, this is a system that produces a lot more, in, in the House of Commons, a lot more debate. Well, how would you, we have about a minute left. I'm just mm. curious. You, you, you know the system so well. How would you contrast the two? Well, it's a good point. Uh, Senator Coleman made, uh, uh, George W. Bush would say he misunderestimated me. Uh, he thought I was uh, just a working class uh, son of immigrants uh, from a Scottish city. How could I stand up to the princes of the Senate? And therein lies the point. These senators regard themselves as princes and other people treat them as if they were princes. No one goes into the court of the Sultan and speaks the truth to them. I got up close personal and punched the uh, living daylights uh, out of them. It's good you made the Muhammad Ali uh, analogy. Uh, I'm a former boxer myself. Rocky Marciano was the model I purposefully set out to follow on that day. I decided not to be Muhammad Ali, not to be Mike Tyson. A punch. Just to be Rocky Marciano, remorselessly punching, punching, punching. But as a boxer, I can tell you that you see in the other guy's eyes the point at which he wishes he was no longer there. In <laughs> boxing, you can throw in the towel but in politics, in front of live TV cameras from all over the world, you simply cannot. And he, he, there was no escaping. He could run, but he couldn't hide. Look up on YouTube. It's uh, George Galloway versus uh, Norm Coleman, who uh, is long gone. But uh, George Galloway, of course, is on the, on the ascent. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Welcome. Report. Pleasure. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, George Gorgeous Galloway, a member of parliament for the Respect Party.